Welcome to Kaiser Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. Welcome back to the show, John. Jim, pleasure to be back on the show. John, what's the current outlook for juniors engaged in uranium exploration? Any such discussion about the junior uranium sector uh, always dwells on the fact that uh, given all the uh, uh, nuclear power plants on the drawing board in construction and the current state of affairs in terms of uh, new supply being mobilized, by, by 2030, w- there will be a supply deficit uh, as demand exceeds what's uh, in the production pipeline. But there's a big problem with this narrative, and this problem is Kazakhstan. It's the elephant in the room. Now, the uranium bubble that got going in 2004 and ran to about 2007, uh, it, it was based on the end of the uh, whole uh, um, you know, conversion of former nuclear warheads uh, in Russia after the Soviet uh, Union collapsed. And and, uh, all of a sudden we realized that China uh, saw nuclear energy as a key foundation for its future. And the price of uranium, spot uranium, U308, it went from around sort of $9, $10 a pound where it was very uninteresting except for very high-grade mines in places such as the Athabasca Basin. It ran to $140, uh, in part because there was a, uh, a uranium participation trust that uh, cleaned up whatever loose spot the uh, uranium there was on the market, and it went way up. And the, and the uh, long-term contracts uh, eventually got as high as $80, $90 a pound. But that all settled down, and then came Fukushima in 2011. And Fukushima... Uh, understandably, the Japanese, which is a very, the, whose country is very earthquake prone, they shut down their nuclear industry to assess, uh, okay, how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to prevent uh, further disasters? But the big unexpected development was Germany's knee-jerk reaction to pull the plug on its nuclear energy uh, uh, capacity. And so they wound that all down. And this decision, which uh, somehow seemed to be based on the idea that cheap Russian natural gas was a better alternative to expensive uh, nuclear power, this has now come back to bite them. And the uh, the problem is, as now they rethink, um, well, maybe we should bring these back online as we deal with this uh, uh, Russian curtailment of uh, of natural gas. The problem with that is, once you shut down a nuclear power plant, you have a one- to two-year certification cycle to make sure it's going to work properly. So that means nuclear energy is of no use to Germany right now dealing with uh, Russia's blackmail of Europe uh, over the uh, Ukraine Ukraine invasion. So that's not going to happen. And in two years, Putin either runs Europe or he somehow disappeared from the scene or it's all come to a nuclear holocaust and, and nothing really, really matters. Um, but the other plants, like countries like India and China, they continue to want to develop nuclear power plants. And the last year, the, in 2021, the, uh, all these various parties with sort of vested stakes in, in uranium juniors and, 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 and smaller producer type companies, they finally said, we got to do something about this endless supply of uh, utilities uh, on, uh, getting that, that are no longer requiring uh, nuclear fuel, unloading their stockpiles, feeding them into the market. And in 2016, that's, that's when the uranium price collapsed uh, below $20 even. And, and this, since 2016, the juniors have had a really tough time. But last year... Finally, uh, the, the spot particip- uh, uranium participation uh, trust, uh, uh, it or physical trust, uh, it started raising a lot of money to buy this um, you know, uranium in the spot market, and the price even got over sixty dollars a pound uh, this year. But in the last quarter, along with the sort of sell-off and, and everything, it's retreated back into the forty to fifty dollar a pound range. Now. You really need 60 to 80 dollars a pound as sort of a long-term price, uh, you know, ignoring the potential of, of inflation to continue as it has in the past year 
for there to be a meaningful new supply mobilized to take care of needs beyond beyond 2030. But in that 40 to $50 range, uh, the, the, the low front deposits uh, in places like the United States, uh, they're not, they're very low grade, you know, 0.1, 0.2%. They're not very interesting. But the Athabasca Basin, which is a unique part of the world where very high grade deposits, in fact, some lenses can be as high as 88% uh, U3, U308. This is where 40 to $50, you actually can discover something that's very, very valuable. And these ten, at, with these sorts of grades, when once you get over 2% uh, uranium, then, then you start getting into like $15,000 rock and these deposits are small, so they are not big, giant, earth-moving uh, operations. And in the Athabasca Basin, uh, pretty much everything's going to be an underground operation at this stage, at this stage anyways. So I think the Given that uranium hasn't really rebased into the sixty to eighty dollar a pound range, I think the the outlook for the uh, 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 the the, the uh, exploration juniors it's best for those looking in places such as the Athabasca Basin where you can make high grade discoveries, and not so good for these other regions where they, the deposits are much lower grade. And there's potential regions such as Nunavut's Phelan Basin, which uh, has evidence of higher grade, uh, similar to what we see in the uh, in the Athabasca Basin. That's also worth looking at right now. But for me, the outlook for Exploration Juniors focused on the Athabasca Basin and its periphery that that is fairly bullish right now, even though uh, uranium is still in the sort of forty to fifty dollar a pound range. Now, the elephant in the room with this whole debate is Kazakhstan. Uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, uh, and we started to see what all the individual countries that used to be part of the Soviet empire uh, uh, were producing, it emerged that Kazakhstan was producing anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 tons of uranium per year. And at the time, Canada was the dominant producer of 8,000 to 12,000 tons per year. And Canada peaked at 14,000 tons in 2016. But today, or last year, its production was uh, about 4,700 tons, uh, up from the lowish 3,900 tons of 2020. But what really uh, changed was Kazakhstan in around 2009. And it went from this uh, level of about 3,000 tons per annum. It just soared. In fact, it peaked at 24,700 tons in 2016. And the key was the in situ leach that they do. They have these low grade roll front deposits just like elsewhere. But Kazakhstan is a place where uh, you can get, you can mine much cheaper than in other jurisdictions where there are people who complain about the way things are being done. So Kazakhstan has emerged from this uh, sort of smallish producer to now representing 45% of global supply. Now, the, 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 the question that I don't, would love to see an answer from is how sustainable is Kazakhstan's production at these levels? Uh, is it depleting its uh, resources that it can in situ leach? What's its capacity to expand? And that's really the, the long-term question for, for the uranium sector is, uh, has, is Kazakhstan basically plateaued and will decline over the next while, or does it have the ability to keep expanding supply and taking care of the needs of new uh, reactors that, that come on stream, even 20, 30, and beyond? And they're obviously making money between 40 and $50 a pound, so, so for them, they can just uh, keep increasing it, and they don't mind uh, keeping, uh, you know, leaving money on the table by by not letting the price go up, such as say the oil producers do. Uh, they, they're happy to dominate dominate this market. But this also creates a question, an interesting question of supply dependency. Uh, the rest of the world getting 45 percent of its um, uranium from Kazakhstan uh, in January. Uh, there was a protest uh, 
involving uh, the former uh, uh, dictator, the leader, uh, Uzultan Nazarbayev, who, who ran the country until he retired in 2019. Uh, something related to him, between him and his successor, uh, that, that resulted in these protests. And the uh, current president, Kasim Yomar Tokayev, he called in Russia to help him quell this uprising, whose nature still isn't really understood. And so Putin sent in several thousand sh- soldiers and uh, restored order, and we haven't heard much since. But uh, a month or so later, he invaded the Ukraine. And now the question is, well, what is the relationship between Kazakhstan and Russia? Will at some time uh, Putin move to reconstitute the Soviet empire by annexing all these former Stan companies, countries that have, you know, became independent after the collapse, you know, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, all of them that are sort of the southern part of Central, Central Asia. And uh, if this happens, will the rest of the world want to continue to rely on these, on, on Kazakh uh, uranium supply. And then there's the question, too, how stable will Kazakhstan remain? Will it be able to continue to uh, operate its in-situ mines and supply the world indefinitely? And that's the reason why I'm very interested in the Athabasca Basin and the juniors there, you know, chemical, uh, instead of... Uh, you know, produce, losing money producing uh, MacArthur River, uh, the, the richest uh, uranium mine. Well, it, it shut it down, suspended operations, and, and fulfilled its long-term contracts by buying uranium in the spot market and delivering it um, to its long-term, long-term customers. And uh, with the price rising, we can see groups like Chemical bringing MacArthur River back on stream but even there, we can see depletion coming. So within 10 years, a lot of these big mines will be out of ore. And there's all this infrastructure like the Key Lake Mill. It's it's present there. It's all permitted. And there will be these big guys, Arano and the Denison and uh, Chemical. They will have an appetite for new deposits that are discovered, especially in the eastern flank of the Athabasca Basin. New projects such as Next Gen's Arrow Project, it's on, on the western flank. That would have to be a standalone from scratch, from scratch operation. So, um, if you want to have some sort of independence of this Kazakhstan supply vulnerability, Saskatchewan's Athabasca Basin is the place to focus your exploration activities, and that's why I am fairly keen about juniors that are doing exploration, generating targets, drilling them, and hopefully coming up with a high-grade discovery that can then turn that junior into a discovery delineation play that hopefully goes through the S-curve speculation normally associated with an emerging discovery. John, you say Kazakhstan could supply most of the world's uranium needs for the foreseeable future, but why do we hear a lot of talk about Russian uranium supply as an argument for the U.S. to subsidize domestic uranium production. This argument is based on a major confusion. Russia is the sixth largest uranium producer in the world, about 5.5% of the 48,000 tons that were produced in 2021, worth about $4.4 billion at the average $35 a pound price last year. What's really interesting is Russia has been very keen about expanding its uh, nuclear reactor capacity and its requirements, according to the World Nuclear Org website, uh, it's double what it produced last year. So Russia is not a supplier of mined uranium. What has happened, however, is that uh, Russia has developed substantial enrichment capacity And something that many people don't quite understand is that uh, most of a pound of uranium is actually useless as reactor fuel. The natural uranium consists of two isotopes. There's U-238 and U-235. Only the U-235 has the uh, fissile capacity to, 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 to undertake fission. 
The rest of it, the U-238, it's useless. So in order for nuclear reactors to be able to, to get the fission going, this ore needs to be enriched. And, and there's, there's uh, several processes for doing it. Uh, Russia has set up substantial capacity for this. And because Russia being a, an autocracy where downstream victims have no say in anything, the cost of stuff made and processed in Russia is, is, is lower than in other jurisdictions such as Europe and the United States. And there's plenty of enrichment capacity around the world, but everybody likes to ship it to uh, Russia where it can be bought, where the fuel can be bought uh, at, at a cheaper price. And much of uh, Kazakhstan supply goes to Russia, and Russia, of course, uh, buys some of it for its own nuclear reactor needs, but it exports the enriched uranium to the, to the rest of the world. And, and this is analogous to a situation in China. Uh, China dominates in production of a lot of metals, but even more importantly, and this is often overlooked, China has extraordinary processing and refining capacity for concentrates of metals mined elsewhere in the world. The lithium is, 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 a, is a great example. Uh, China doesn't produce that much lithium. It's maybe 17% of global supply. But almost all lithium concentrate, the spotamine concentrate, gets uh, processed in refineries based in China. And again, why? Well, China is an autocracy where the downstream victims have no say in what the costs get dumped onto them. And the rest of the world is perfectly happy to get the cheaper goods from, you know, from these jurisdictions where they can be upgraded to the end product that the, the quality end product that the end users need for, for the manufacturing capacity. So the solution is really simple. You don't need to subsidize uranium mines in the United States. You just need to be willing to pay the higher price to uh, uh, enrich the uranium that's mined in places like Canada or Kazakhstan, Australia, Namibia, and enrich it on, in, in your territory, and you have all the uh, uh, supply that you need. So although I mentioned earlier that Kazakhstan's uh, proximity to Russia and its relationship, uh, uh, its potential to become like Belarus, really a slave nation to, uh, to, to, to Russia. Th that is, I think, a, a, a real risk. But it's also still far enough away that it can continue to supply the rest of the world. So it, it's nonsense to talk about uh, needing to subsidize uh, uh, uranium prices in the United States in order to... Uh, mine uh, of uranium in the United States. And last year, the United States had no uranium production at all because basically the price has been, has been too low. So there's plenty of uranium from stable places like Namibia, Australia, Canada to take care of the world's needs. And again, the Athabasca Basin is a place where there's still enormous potential of high-grade uranium that can be found and mined and supply to the non-autocracies in the world that still operate nuclear power reactors. If the Athabasca Basin is your favorite place to explore for uranium, is there any junior you're watching closely for a discovery in northern Alberta? Last week, one of my companies that I have tagged as a bottom fish, a Can Alaska Uranium, it made an announcement about uh, drilling at its West MacArthur project in the eastern flank of the Athabasca Basin. And uh, this, I think, signals a major new discovery. Now, Can Alaska is one of these companies that have been involved in, in uranium exploration in the Athabasca Basin and even beyond in places like, like Manitoba for, for the past 20 years. And it has a very large portfolio of projects, but the most important one has been West MacArthur, and they had Mitsubishi as a partner. Mitsubishi spent almost $17 million before losing interest, uh, you know, sort of coinciding with what was going on in Japan uh, with Fuku Fukushima and then the realization, well, we probably won't need any more uranium uh, and, and nuclear, nuclear fuel if we're going to keep everything shut down 
shut down indefinitely. So Can Alaska was able to to buy back its stake from from Mitsubishi and and then ended up doing a deal in 2016 with Chemical. Now Chemical and Orano they own the uh, sort of surrounding ground and on the trend of the structure that passes through the uh, West MacArthur uh, uh, project, uh, they have found the uh, the Fox Lake deposit. And this is about 8% uranium, and it looks like it's a couple of pods that total maybe 400,000 tons. And Chemical was interested in chasing the, the trend onto the West MacArthur project, and it had a deal, a two-stage deal, and it spent $5 million and paid a uh, Seven twenty-five thousand uh, to to uh, earn thirty percent interest in, in twenty eighteen, but it declined to uh, to get to, to go to the next level by continuing to spend. It had obviously concluded that the area of the forty-two zone where there is a uh, mineralization, but it's not a clear-cut uh, 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 ore body. That well, okay, this is not going to make our Fox Lake system system bigger. So, can Alaska? You know, took old took old back operatorship, and uh, it has spent money since then, and uh, and its seventy percent interest has increased to seventy seven percent. Now, last year in November, they did a really big financing of about twelve twelve million dollars. Uh, so they were cashed up again, uh, and they were had going to do a five million dollar program, a twelve fold program in West MacArthur, and they had done. Uh, some, some more gravity surveys and uh, 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 EM surveys towards to the southwest of the uh, of the uh, uh, 42 zone, uh, which itself, you know, it's alteration has some mineralization, but it's not very interesting. And they had two conductors identified, and and they they had two rigs on the property, and uh, one of them um, doesn't appear to have hit anything that they felt worth reporting. But Friday on, on July 15th, they reported that hole 67 had intersected uh, six meters of highly, high, highly mineralized uranium uh, between nine, uh, from, from about 906 meters on. And they published pictures and, uh, you know, given their, you know, centralometer uh, clicks per second, 39,000. It's in for rush assay. They do have an E-type probe where you can lower the probe down the hole and uh, and measure what the uh, walls of the of, of the hole are in terms of uranium grade, and it's quite accurate. But some steel rods were dropped into the hole, so they couldn't do this. So they're they're waiting for the geochemical assays, and I think it'll be a couple percent or more. But it's the geological context which has them excited. Uh, in in their update presentation that they published. Uh, they have all these uh, declarations and they're like sticky sticky labels. Uh, this is new and significant. Now, between Mitsu, Mitsubishi uh, themselves and Chemical, there's been all, there will have been $30 million spent by the end of the year on this project. So they should have some idea of what is new and significant. And you think, okay, that's kind of like a promotional thing. They're trying to pump up the stock. But in fact, I'm actually calling the shareholders and saying, "Don't sell, don't sell." I know this is a terrible market, and, and we were below below 30 cents after everything got financed and 40, 50 cents last last year. But but don't sell. Wait wait for these results. And they, this structure that they've uh, intersected with uh, this apparent high grade uranium interval, it's about 100 meters beneath the unconformity between the sandstone and the basement rock. Uh, it's narrow, so this is sort of the basement-hosted portion of what they call an ingress-style system, and uh, they were hoping to wedge off that hole and hit it higher up, get at the unconformity, because that's where sort of a MacArthur River type, a uh, bigger blob and perhaps even richer can be present. Uh, but they've uh, realized that the wedge hasn't worked, so the, the, the hole that they're drilling right now is actually going to intersect the structure 25, 25 meters deeper. Now, MacArthur River itself is about 600 meters depth, and the um, and this is now 800 to 900 meters depth. But the geological context, the intense alteration halo that they are observing in this, uh, this is telling them we finally latched onto something significant. The stock has 
bumped as high as 49 cents. It's now in sort of the 40, 40, 44 to 48 cent range. Uh, the volume has cooled down. The market wants to see the geochemical assays. You know how how much is this? And then of course you know they they don't really know from one hole what the geometry of this system is. So they they're getting that second rig and they're setting it up to drill a proper pilot hole so that they can uh, uh, explore this up dip and a long strike uh, at near the unconformity. That'll take, uh, that, that hole will take about 20 days to com complete. So we won't really get that, the sort of visuals uh, until maybe um, you know, four, three, four weeks, weeks from now confirming that this isn't just a free hole that they've intersected, but yes, this is the beginning of a substantial substantial new, new discovery. So that one right now is my favorite, and, and so I decided, well, let's, uh, what, what's the potential upside from this? And, and assuming that the, they just end up with a basement-hosted system that can be conventionally mined and not involve all this complicated uh, freezing activities such as uh, has to be done with MacArthur River, I took the numbers from uh, NextGen's Aero project, and they published a feasibility study in February 2021, and so I visualized, uh, okay, what if they can find 5 million tons of 2.5% uh, 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 ore in the basement that can be conventionally mined underground and use the cost assumptions from, from the Aero project? Uh, and I come up with a sort of a 3.5 million billion Canadian outcome, net, net present, uh, after tax net present value, Using an eight percent uh, discount rate, and and that's a substantial prize. If they have something of that scale there, that ultimately is is a nineteen dollar price uh, a price for the stock. Uh, you know, assuming they don't need to significantly dilute, they have a whole bunch of warrants coming coming due uh, in November through through January. They could raise another four million dollars. The company. Uh, uh, we'll have $9 million left at the end of this year, so they will not need to uh, 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 raise any money over the next five months. Uh, they'll continue with this 12-hole uh, program uh, and focus on this discovery, and they can drill year-round in this particular location. So I think Can Alaska, Can Alaska's uh, West MacArthur, after $30 million spent over a 20-year period on this project, uh, it suddenly hit that, yielded that uh, discovery, and yes, it's deep, 900 meters, but that shouldn't really be a problem uh, as you're moving deeper into the basin, the, uh, the unconformity in the very center, it's 1,500 meters deep, but this is still a, 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 a you know, within mining reach, and if it has both uh, the uh, uh, basement hosted mineralization and some at the unconformity, this could be a solution to chemicals, uh, you know, future key mill uh, running out of, out, of, out, of, out of feedstock. So the entire CapEx of developing a standalone facility may not need to happen. So definitely watch Can Alaska Uranium and its emerging uh, West MacArthur discovery. Who else do you like that's positioned to deliver a discovery in the Athabasca Basin? Well, during our... Uh, Discovery Watch uh, years, uh, a junior that I often talked about was Forum Energy Metals. And like, like, like uh, Can Alaska Uranium, it has been involved in the Athabasca Basin for, for 15 years since that sort of 2004 uh, period uh, uh, when the uranium bubble got, got going. And it has multiple projects. And that all hit the wall in, in 2015. Uh, when, when the uranium price collapsed and suddenly there was no more appetite for spending money searching for a high-grade uh, discovery in the Athabasca Basin. And what caught my attention at the time, around 2017-18, uh, uh, was they had picked up a land position outside the basin called Janus Lake, which was a, uh, a, a, a sediment-hosted copper system with, with a silver, silver credit. And this ended up attracting the attention of Rio Tinto, and it, it spent like 15, 15, 16 million dollars, uh, enough to uh, vest for its initial 51% uh, interest. Uh, uh, but they they lost interest at the end of last year. 
They clearly didn't get the uh, sort of intervals and, and, and tonnage footprints that they were looking for. They did make the $100,000 payment to keep the option alive uh, uh, for another year from May of this year onwards. But the, uh, the, the, the decision as to um, whether to vest or not, they haven't really given the company that notice, but they have until June of next year. So this project effectively became dead, and it forced Forum Energy to pivot back to its portfolio of uranium projects. And I'd always looked at this, okay, this is uh, if, if uranium ever gets out of its rut and becomes popular again, uh, this, this portfolio of assets that they hold, uh, uh, this could become very, very interesting. And indeed, this is what uh, is happening. One of the projects, the Fur Island, they optioned out to Orano. Unfortunately, they didn't do any work this year. The prior year, they did work, but we had a, a, a warm winter, so the ice didn't get strong enough for them to, to support the targets that they were drilling. So, so the stock is kind of slumped uh, with, with the Janus Lake uh, 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 stalling out the Love Lake uh, PGM project, also there in northern Saskatchewan. They are hoping to find Boise's Bay-type deposits at depth, but they never really did find any good EM, EM conductors that would indicate sulfides in the one that they did have. It didn't really yield anything interesting. So that project has also died. But they managed to last year stake a new project on, on it's actually outside the basement, uh, not sitting on the sandstone. It's outside the basement. It's, it's it, uh, the cover of the surface rocks are the basement rock. It's called the Wollaston property. Some junior had held it uh, for a long time. It's had lots of holes drilled on it, but it was all based on old geophysics uh, uh, where they would see these uh, linears and they would just sort of track along them. And, and the way the Athabasca Basin works is there are these fault structures that cut through and all these plays that come off these fault structures and the hydrothermal systems come up these fault structures, circulate through them, and within these salt structures, uh, thanks to the sandstone uh, the sediments uh, that overlie the, 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 the crystalline uh, uh, basement rocks, the gneisses and so on, graphite tends to develop within these fault structures, and graphite may have some role to play in causing the uranium to drop out as it circulates uh, through this system but it's more used as a tool to see where these structures are because the uranium deposits are going to be sitting inside these structures, either at the unconformity where the structure passes through both sandstone and basement uh, or in the basement rocks itself, and sometimes even perched, perched higher up. So they, they managed to get a drill program going, drilled about seven, seven holes. Uh, uh, they had done a gravity survey, and gravity surveys... Uh, are a way of detecting you look, uh, where the along these structures um, hydrothermal activity has rotted the uh, minerals out of the rock, reduced it to clay, and that creates a lower density. Instead of it being sort of 2.6 uh, specific gravity, it drops down to 2.0. So they do these gravity surveys over these areas where they're they're seeing these um, linear linear structures, and uh, when they see a gravity low. Well, that's good. So here's the structure where the uh, fluids could have come up, and here's the gravity low showing that the fluids did come up and rot out uh, the surrounding rock through to alteration. And the gizmo target, it yielded a, you know, a, a piddly 0.2% uranium interval, but that wasn't really the, the important news. The important news was, yes, this is an, uh, the hydrothermal system was active here, and they are going to go back in and do a, a, a more detailed a helicopter-based uh, EM survey to better refine the structures and go back in there in, in the um, in, in early next year uh, in the winter. And, and right now it's a stock to accumulate because they're not doing any drilling this year in the Athabasca Basin, but they have $3.5 million. And what I find really interesting is that they are going back to their northwest Athabasca Basin project, and that is on the way on the western western flank of the Athabasca Basin. And there is a deposit there found a long time ago uh, uh, called uh, Maurice Maurice Bay. It's, it's it's fairly low grade, only half a percent, and uh, not not very not very big. 
but there's plenty of evidence of uranium mineralization, active hydrothermal systems in that area. And they have a 39.5%. And they have all these partners like uh, NextGen and Chemical and Orano. And, uh, and, and th- but they are the operator. And they're proposing a $2 million program for this. And if none of the other parties participate, then they could go to 51%. So the big meeting is August 10th. Is anybody going to participate? They have two targets. The last time they did any work was in 20, 2015. They drilled a number of gravity gravity lows, but there's a couple called Andy and uh, and and the other one, Spring Spring Bay in the northeastern part. The Spring Bay is the larger one. It's several kilometers, four four kilometers long, but uh, they're in a context, a geological context, where th- these could be. Uh, you know, significant uh, deposits uh, uh, present. So they'll go in there, they'll drill that in, in the first quarter of next year. And if they have a discovery, uh, well, this is this would have to be a standalone type operation in the western part, so it'll have to be pretty big. But, yeah, they are in there, and they'll go back into the Wollaston on the eastern flank where they're looking for sort of smaller high-grade deposits. Uh, they would like to find something similar to what ISO Energy found uh, with its uh, hurricane discovery, and this this is quite amazing. It's it's only a tiny deposit. Uh, the resource is 68,000 tons, but uh, it's 34 34% uh, uranium. That's uh, that's like 35,000 35,000 dollar rock, and the whole deposit they have is worth about in situ about 2.2 billion, and so it, it's got a you know three four hundred million dollar valuation. Lots of other projects, so. You know, the, the upside for ISA Energy making something similar, well, it's already happened. So that's not one to, uh, you know, like a forum energy where you have a 15 cent stock with plenty of upside if they do tag into a high grade zone like that. And in this area with the Wollaston project, it's where, um, uh, Denison and, uh, Orano are, are working with their Sabre, Sabre technology, with it, which is a form of, uh, mining these smallish deposits such as hurricane by just drilling down and, and, and blenderizing the deposit and sucking it up so it doesn't involve sinking a shaft. So in terms of finding these smaller, very high-grade deposits uh, in the eastern flank of the Athabasca Basin where they're not too deep, obviously you couldn't do that with a 900-meter deep uh, uh, deposit such as the um, the new, new emerging discovery at at, at West MacArthur, but in the uh, shallower parts where if you can find these overlooked uh, high-grade pods, these could end up becoming a uh, mill feed for the Denison, Denison operation. So uh, Athabasca Basin, I like the exploration there. I'm open to other companies developing interesting targets. Uh, I think Canalaska Uranium is the one to focus on right now, pay close attention to the news flow coming out of West MacArthur. And, and accumulate form energy and prepare for, uh, uh, you know, next year for them going back and drilling two projects. And again, if Can Alaska Uranium does deliver a major discovery, that's going to uh, ignite excitement uh, for the broader Athabasca Basin. Uh, so yeah, here again, juniors are doing it. They're persisting. They're doing the science, and they're finally, instead of always being unlucky are getting lucky and tagging into it. And once you have a context such as West MacArthur, well, then it's just money and time to, to chase around and grope around it and build a deposit gradually over time. John, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome, Jim. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Kaiser Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as a recommendation to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at kaiserresearch.com.